Kept you waiting, huh? Finally, it's episode 80 of NES Works. June 1988 sees the debut of what would become one of the NES's most prolific new publishers, Illinois-based Ultra Games, who came from seemingly nowhere to deliver one of the most intriguing and original NES games yet seen to date. No one knew who these freshman developers were, but they made a great first impression with their stylish trade dress and a truly incredible military simulation adventure. Well, that was the thought at the time. These days, we know better. The advent of Ultra and Metal Gear versus what we know about both the publisher and the game today has definitely gone down as one of the bigger gaps in contemporaneous perception versus the retrospective reality of the business. Today we collectively realize the hollow truth of Ultra games, as well as the flaccid reality of this version of Metal Gear, which is but a pitiful effigy of the real thing. So let's talk about reality. For starters, Ultra games did not exist in any real sense of the word. It was, as publishers go, a paper tiger, a front company for a more prolific NES game maker who had to file some paperwork and design a fake logo in order to jump through some arbitrary hoops established by Nintendo. Ultra Games is, in effect, a clerical quirk that allowed another entity to work within the constraints of the platform, constraints that had been established in order to prevent the NES market from shriveling under the relentless mediocrity of unfettered third-party content the way the American industry had previously imploded five years earlier during the Atari 2600 era. When third parties first arrived on Atari 2600, it seemed like a good thing. Activision made great games, as good or even better than Atari's own, and that company credited its designers, rather than treating them as interchangeable wage slaves. A revolutionary step forward for the fledgling industry. But not every third party was Activision, a company established by some of Atari's most creative programmers and artists. In fact, no other third party was Activision. And before long, every opportunistic, fly-by-night con artist who could cobble together the resources and hire the talent to produce something that would technically function on the 2600 had its own Atari-focused publishing label. While a handful of these newly founded studios lucked into hiring staff with talent and creative drive, most did not. For every guaranteed decent cartridge to reach stores from the likes of Atari, Activision, Imagic, or Parker Brothers, Atari fans seemingly had to sort through a dozen ramshackle wrecks by some unknown studio whose staff had likely amounted to a huckster paying a high school kid who had learned some basic programming to badly copy a popular arcade hit. Naturally, this situation couldn't last for long, and it didn't, with the American Atari market collapsing in on itself to the point that it took out every competing console. By late 1984, entire months would pass without a single new console game for any device launching in the U.S., by the time Nintendo brute-forced its way into the US, the same pattern was taking shape on the Japanese Famicom. The earliest Famicom third parties, namely Hudson and Namco, were trusted Nintendo partners who employed skilled creators that obviously cared about the quality of their work as they converted top-flight computer and arcade games to the console. But as Famicom rolled into 1985, less reliable and capable studios began to emerge. Jalico arrived first, some acceptable arcade conversions that didn't hold a candle to Namco's. By October 1985, when the NES debuted in America, the Famicom library had swollen in numbers, but not quality, with such fare as patchy media license cash-ins by Bandai, janky releases from music labels like Pony Canyon and Toshiba EMI, and even some faltering first steps by Sunsoft, a future NES powerhouse that had a rough start on the console. Media pundits predicted the Famicom boom was over, and Nintendo attempted with only moderate success, to wrest control of the platform back from third parties by instituting a licensing scheme and shifting its development focus entirely to the Famicom Disk System peripheral for a couple of years. In the West, however, Nintendo saw the effective blank slate of a moribund market as an opportunity to set terms from the start. Not only did it incorporate a security protection chip into the American and European NES consoles that required third parties to be properly licensed in order for their games to boot on the hardware, they also enacted strict limitations on what those third parties could do. For one thing, Nintendo required all third-party NES cartridges to be manufactured internally by Nintendo, a stipulation that didn't exist in Japan. Secondly, the company set a firm rule, one confirmed many times in interviews with former licensees over the years, that third parties could only ship a maximum of five games apiece per year. Nintendo's impulses here weren't necessarily wrong. The Famicom library would ultimately contain twice as many games as the American NES lineup, 
but those additional 700 releases were, as anyone who has ever binged Crontendo is aware, mostly no great loss. Most of the best games that failed to make their way to the West on NES wouldn't have been released here anyway for cultural or technical reasons. Given the morass of sloppy 8-bit churn that dominated Famicom shelves, Nintendo's limitations prevented some opportunistic Western publisher from sweeping in and licensing dozens of terrible Japanese releases to dump on the US market. We've already seen a more benign version of that business approach on NES with Bruderbund and Sunsoft, whose releases to this point have encompassed carts released in Japan by Hudson, Irem, and Namco. It's not hard to imagine someone like LJN grabbing a ton of garbage from the likes of Tonkin House, BAP, and Coconuts Japan and inundating American audiences with awful platformers and wretched sports games. Of course, Nintendo of America also reserved the right of concept approval and refusal for third-party titles. That was never a hardline stance, and it seemed to evaporate fairly early in the NES's life. Look at some of the disastrous games released in 1989 and beyond, and you really start to wonder about that Nintendo seal of quality. Oh, but you came here to see a Metal Gear video. Don't worry, I promise this will all be relevant. While Nintendo's protectionist approach to licensing was understandable and probably did a lot to maintain the long-term viability of both the NES market and, by extension, the US console industry it resuscitated, it infamously worked to the disadvantage of third parties in many respects. In the case of Konami, it prevented a ridiculous number of great games from reaching America. Konami was a true marvel in the late 80s, a developer and publisher that managed to release not only an immense number of games, but also somehow mostly released good games, sometimes great. Famicom Disk System included, Konami ultimately published something like 80 or 90 games for the platform in Japan over the course of about eight years, which of course is well more than five per year. And while not every single one of those games was a winner, the ratio of good to bad in Konami's 8-bit library is arguably better than any other companies of that era, despite its immensity. And those were just Japanese releases. Like most Japanese publishers, Konami also realized the importance of publishing titles in the West that would appeal specifically to those markets. There was simply no way for Konami to bring all their Japanese releases to America, plus publish US exclusives with only 10 slots per year, short of licensing them to some other publisher, which of course would have taken a huge bite out of their earnings. And so Konami's solution was simply to become their own some other publisher. And thus Ultra Games, a shell company that existed simply as a dodge to bypass Nintendo's restrictions on annual release quotas. It's hard to imagine Nintendo didn't know exactly what Ultra Games was. It's also not hard to see how Ultra Games didn't give everyone an easy way to get what they wanted. Konami could publish more of its games in America, while Nintendo would get more Konami games on its system, which is a desirable outcome in the 80s. While technically not playing favorites or bending the rules for any one company, because after all, Ultra Games was a different company, not Konami, right? So over the next four or five years, Ultra would generally, though not always, serve as the destination for games Konami specifically geared toward the US market. That includes conversions of computer games like CinemaWare's Defender of the Crown, a port of Gottlieb's Qbert, and a number of releases based on Western properties, including Mission Impossible and some esoteric indie comic called Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Not only had Metal Gear already been released in Japan, it had already been released twice over there. The original Metal Gear appeared on MSX Home Computer, which had so little traction in the US as to make no difference. The Famicom, and later NES port, were no doubt a convenient way to get a groundbreaking, action-packed military adventure into the international market more effectively. But while Metal Gear may have been a Japanese creation through and through, it owed a tremendous debt to American pop culture. The game's designer, a young nerd named Hideo Kojima, is well known for his obsessive love of American film and Western music, to the point that his first release after departing Konami, Death Stranding, was an absolutely unapologetic exercise in starfucking, and Jeff Keighley for some reason. Metal Gear includes references to The Terminator, both in the fact that its box art traces Michael Bean's Kyle Reese, and includes a pair of near-indestructible cyborgs called Arnold's. There's a boss named Coward Duck, a nod to the Marvel Comics character Howard the Duck, definitely not to the movie. The protagonist's codename, Solid Snake, comes from Escape from New York's main character, Snake Plissken. The structure and design of the action bear more than a passing similarity to that of pac and Video's Super Rambo special for MSX2, a game based, of course, on the Stallone movie First Blood Part II. Later games in the series would lean even harder on Western influences, with bosses seemingly designed in the style of G.I. Joe villains, references to bands like Ultravox, 
more Schwarzenegger nods, a makeover for Snake that turned him into a fusion of Jean-Claude Van Damme and Christopher Walken, and more. But even here, this simple emphasis on semi-realistic military espionage and Cold War anxiety speaks to the taste of American gamers more than to Japanese, making Metal Gear a great dry run for the Ultra label. And this was indeed a phenomenal game. Imagine a military version of The Legend of Zelda, with the emphasis removed from magical swords and slaying goblins, or moblins, and shifted instead to assault weapons and evading patrols. Not only that, but Metal Gear had a storyline. It's a simple storyline to be sure, sneak into an enemy fortress to find some missing allies, then prevent a nuclear strike against the West, but it's one that unfolds over the course of the game through in-person dialogue and remote conversations, something that simply hadn't appeared to this degree on any NES game. The closest comparison would be, ironically enough, Acclaim and Pac-In Video's Rambo, the NESification of Super Rambo Special, which shipped for NES a few weeks ahead of Metal Gear. Rambo for NES may not be as bad as its latter-day reputation suggests, but it nevertheless it does not hold a candle to Metal Gear. This is a deliberate, thoughtfully designed adventure based around a careful lock and key structure, one where players can only advance with the use of tools, weapons, and key dialogue events. It has a linear structure and a seemingly open sandbox, and it constantly places players into situations that can only be navigated by paying attention to mission instruction prompts and hunting for essential items to bypass barriers to progression. The enemy fortress, Outer Heaven, spans multiple buildings across a wide compound, with a fair amount of geography between its structures. To pass through the sandy wastes and reach buildings further into the site, you need both a compass to help you navigate the trackless desert, and a container of anti-venom in the inevitable event you're stung by scorpions while making the trek. Before you can find the compass, however, you need to take out the Arnold cyborgs with a rocket launcher in order to acquire card 7, which gives you door access to the desert and to have made radio contact with a resistance fighter named Jennifer. But you won't be able to rescue Jennifer unless you've rescued the POW who knows her radio frequency and managed to have saved enough allies to have reached maximum rank and earned Jennifer's trust. That POW is imprisoned in a building that can only be reached if you've acquired the grenades and landmines that will allow you to destroy the two tanks that block the way, and of course you'll need to have found the proper pass keys to that building in the first place. But in order to get to that point, you'll need to have found the bomb blast suit that lets you bypass a rooftop wind barrier, gas mask for slipping safely through rooms flooded with nerve gas, and the remote-controlled missiles that allow you to take out various control panels that power a number of deadly electrified floors. In other words, Kojima and his team designed Metal Gear to consist of intricately nested objectives that once accomplished unlock new areas and new objectives. It offers the clever brain teasers and need for attentive play seen in computer adventure games, yet it wears the clothing of an arcade shoot-em-up. Even that appearance is deceptive, though. Metal Gear looks like a Commando or Akari Warriors type game, but in action it really plays nothing like those games. Having originally been designed for MSX2, a platform with underperforming support for background scrolling and a more limited number of moving objects than the NES could handle, Metal Gear was conceived as a game about avoiding contact, rather than engaging it whenever possible. For the most part, getting into a firefight in Metal Gear means you messed up. Snake's survivability depends on stealth, on sneaking around enemies rather than gunning them down. If enemies spot or hear you, they'll raise an alarm that calls waves of soldiers whose constant rush to attack three at a time can be incredibly difficult to evade. The sounds that can trigger an alert include the report of nearly all ranged weapons that fired while an enemy soldier happens to be on screen. Your submachine gun may allow you to spray bullets at foes en masse, but it also means you're probably going to be shot to death where you stand for taking the easy approach. Snake's safest tools for survival are his fists, which allow him to sneak up on bad guys from behind, punch them, and stun them, and potentially kill them without making a sound, and his basic handgun once you acquire a silencer for it. Heavy weapons are better safe for showdowns with bosses, special uses where you need to blow through walls or barriers, and desperate measures to evade a throng of enemy soldiers. Here I'm afraid is where we get to the unfortunate reality of Metal Gear on NES, where you can hold up the MSX2 game as a great example of deliberately fair game design, Intended to be manageable for anyone who understands the ins and outs of the game mechanics, the NES version isn't so much that way. It lacks a certain rigor of game design that makes it an inferior work. This isn't simply a case of holding up something foreign and inaccessible as superior to the better known and more widely available product. The conversion team at Konami made some material changes to the game in bringing it from MSX to NES that generally resulted in an inferior work. Not every change is for the worst, mind you. The NES game features a new soundtrack that has a more low-key spy movie vibe to it than the slightly strident march of the MSX soundtrack. And it gives the Ultra Games release a great sense of atmosphere. 
The NES version also tweaked some of the visuals for the better, adding more detail and animation to certain in-game elements. Beyond that, though, the NES game tends to trip over its own feet. Some of these revisions are obvious at a glance. The MSX release, for example, started players right at the entrance of the first building of Outer Heaven, with Snake emerging from the water to slip into that building. On NES, Snake parachutes into the jungle, inexplicably with several other paratroopers whose presence in the intro is never accounted for, then has to make his way into the compound by surviving a gauntlet of guard dogs and soldiers in the jungle, then correctly guessing which of several trucks he needs to enter in order to be transported to the compound interior. The MSX game included a save to tape feature with checkpoints at the most recent elevator or building entrance Snake had passed through. While the NES game uses passwords, and sets fixed checkpoints within the fortress based on Snake's current rank. Several bosses, including the Hind D attack chopper encounter, fail to appear on NES. This includes the boss from which the entire franchise takes its name, Metal Gear, the bipedal, nuclear-capable armored battle mech being developed by the forces of Outer Heaven, appears on the box art of the game. On MSX, it's also the next to last boss you need to destroy. You slap plastique to its legs in a specific sequence while evading roving laser defenses. On NES, the Metal Gear itself never appears. Instead, your act of sabotage against Outer Heaven's ultimate weapon comes down to simply placing explosives on a defenseless giant computer until it explodes. A real anti-climax. Where Metal Gear truly fails, however, is in its treatment of the moment-to-moment -moment game action. The buildings of the Outer Heaven compound have been rearranged, generally retaining most of the rooms present on MSX, but changing up how they fit together. This has the unfortunate side effect of introducing bugs to the game. A few rooms retained the radio message associated with them on MSX, but because they fall into different points in the flow of the action on NES than was intended, they can be confusing or even provide misleading information. The change in structures also means that the buildings themselves have been decompressed, so to speak with entire floors being separated out into standalone buildings. This makes transit between these areas more time-consuming and undermines the sensation that Metal Gear mostly takes place in a couple of ultra-high security facilities. Worst of all, though, the NES game often demonstrates no consideration for the core Metal Gear premise of stealth. Many of the rooms in the fortress are designed in such a way that you literally cannot enter the screen without being spotted and pursued by enemies. On MSX, a careless player could stumble into an enemy patrol while moving from room to room, but careful use of the binoculars item could prevent that. Enemy patrol placement and patterns on MSX nearly always exist in a few possible states per room, and those states will change depending on the direction you enter the screen from in order to increase the ease with which players can avoid being seen. A small, subtle design detail that worked to the player's advantage. On NES, that's not so much the case. Enemy positions don't seem to take the player's position into account, and you'll sometimes simply be forced to deal with mandatory combat even in the early going something that doesn't really happen until the late game on MSX. And the less said about the jokey, vaguely racist introductory story that appears in the manual and has nothing whatsoever to do with the in-game plot, the better. Despite these failings and changes though, Metal Gear is still a better game than about 90% of everything else that's appeared to this point on NES. Whether its changes were enacted due to memory constraints, the conversion team's determination to put their own stamp on the work, or just a sudden fit of incompetence, they weren't severe enough to ruin the game. The underlying excellence of Kojima's concepts still comes through, and it's not like any American kids playing Metal Gear in 1988 were seething at the fact that we were robbed of a superior work. Stealth over aggression was a novel concept for console games when Metal Gear debuted, yet the military action theme made for a game that was nevertheless relatable to a generation of latchkey kids raised on a diet of G.I. Joe and war movies like Top Gun. And Konami, or Ultra, knocked it out of the park with the game's ad campaign appeared in game mags and comic books and focused entirely on all the cool stuff you could acquire. There was a real sense of James Bond about this marketing, the promise that you, you, would be able to use all of this stuff in order to save the day. It presented something far more intriguing than another ad with a painting of grimacing men with guns, allowing the reader to project themselves into the role of the protagonist without even playing the game. It's the silent RPG protagonist principle transferred into another medium, and it was quite a drug. Clearly it did the trick, as Metal Gear evidently sold well enough in the US versus overseas that Konami and Ultra quickly commissioned a US exclusive sequel for NES, which would arrive in 1990 under the names Snake's Revenge. Now, Snake's Revenge isn't great, but it did inspire better Metal Gear sequels. Hideo Kojima didn't have any input into either of the NES games, and he notoriously despises the spurious changes inflicted on Metal Gear for NES, 
but when he caught wind of Snake's revenge, he began work on a true MSX2 follow-up to Metal Gear, which would arrive later in 1990 under the name Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake. Metal Gear 2 easily ranks as one of the greatest 8-bit action-adventure games of all time, and it went on to serve as the series' baseline for game design and narrative references for more than a decade. Meanwhile, the NES game, for all its warts, made for an auspicious debut for Konami's fake publishing label. Although the Ultra Games lineup would be less consistent than the core Konami catalog, its existence meant American NES fans could enjoy twice as many Konami works as they would have otherwise, which is a win-win situation for all involved. Next time on NES Works, what's half of double?